I know this is getting tiresome. After all, I've done six updates already in, on this virus and how it's playing out in markets. But I can't avoid doing the seventh one. And in this one, I'm going to cover two weeks from April 4th to April 17th. And as in prior weeks, I'm going to first start by reporting what markets did and how this played out across the world. And next, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think will happen as this crisis unfolds in terms of how people pick stocks. Specifically, most people pick stocks based on multiples, price earnings ratios, EV to EBITDAs, EV to sales. And I have a sense that this crisis will make people use more multiples because they don't want to do intrinsic valuation. Often with the delusion that doing this avoids, you know, you, you can avoid making the assumptions you make in intrinsic valuation. But I'm going to argue that pricing is going to get more difficult as well in the aftermath of this crisis. So let's get the, the show on the road. Let's start by looking at what markets did over the last two weeks. Now, as you think back over the last eight to nine weeks, the last two weeks were a period of relative quiet. In what sense, if you look at market performance between uh, the, in the, in the, in the last week leading into this one, 410 through 417, not much was happening. The outlier might have been the New Zealand market, which went up about 7%. Most of the markets were pretty close, 1%, 2%. And even if you look at the last month, it looks like a pretty positive month. And that, in a sense, tells you something about this crisis. The first month in the crisis, from the middle of February through March 20th or so, was uniformly negative. Since then, it's been up and down and more positive than negative. And you see that reflected in the monthly returns. If you look at treasuries, the same phenomenon seems to hold. The last two weeks have been a period of relative quiet. Of course, rates are much lower than they were pre-crisis at every level, three months, six months, two year, five year, 10 year. But they held their ground. Basically, they stayed at where they were two weeks ago, perhaps, you know, dropping a little bit at the at the uh, at the uh, 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 for, you know, at the top at the bottom end of the scale and rising as you go a little bit on the top end of the scale. So not much happened in the treasury markets. If you look at the commodity markets, I stayed with um, the two commodities I focused on. One is copper and the other is oil. And you see the bifurcation between the two commodities. Copper, when reflecting the slowdown in the global economy that's coming, is down about 10%. You're saying no surprise there. Oil is down 65% since February 14. It has been a horrific period for oil companies and oil investors. And I don't think there's been a worse period in history in terms of how much oil prices have dropped in such a short period. Now, some of this can be blamed on a gl slowing global economy. But a lot of this has to be oil specific. The battle between Russia and Saudi Arabia, a longer term battle against shale oil in the US, lots of things playing out. I also finally looked at gold and Bitcoin. Why? Because their gold, of course, is a classic crisis asset and it's held its own. It's up about 6% during the crisis, perhaps not as much as some gold investors expected it to be. It's not as strong. A it's not behaved as strongly as it has in other crises. But Bitcoin has been a horrific crisis asset. Much of the damage was done in the first month of this crisis, but it's down about 31% since February 14th. And Ethereum is even worse, down 40%. So overall, that's what the indices and the overall markets did. Now, in the last post that I did, I talked about the price of risk and how it's changed during the crisis. And I looked at two markets, the corporate bond market and the equity market. In the corporate bond market, the price of risk shows up as a default spread. And in this table, you can see what those spreads look like for different ratings from AAA all the way down to C or below. In every ratings class, the default spread today is much larger, often by a magnitude of almost two, to what it was in February 14th. But again, the peak happened in this market in terms of the price of risk happened around April 3rd. And since then, you've seen a little pullback from those peaks. So basically, the price of risk has gone up substantially in the bond market. And that shouldn't surprise you. People are more worried about default risk because more companies are going to default coming out of this crisis. The equity market, I updated the implied equity risk premiums, which I reported last week. And if you remember, on April 1st, the implied equity risk premium, even if you allow for the fact that earnings are going to be lower and cash flows are going to drop off, was 6%, much higher than the 4.7 or 4.8% you saw at the start of the crisis. In fact, if you don't adjust earnings and cash flows, it's more like 6.6% .6 at the start of this month. Since then, 
Now, the market has done better. You've seen the premiums come down. It's now between 5.7 and 6%, depending on how you measure it. So clearly, the price of risk in the equity market has gone up, but it seems to have taken a step back from the highs you saw on March 23rd. So let's now look at how the damage played out by region. If you look across regions, again, no surprises. Similar to my prior updates, you find that China has been the least affected. And interestingly, Africa and Latin America now take top place in terms of the most damaged markets. One of the ironies of crises is often the crises might start in a developed market, but it's emerging markets that often pay the biggest price. And this crisis is no different. You're seeing emerging markets pay a much bigger price than developed markets, again, excluding China. The US is down about 16%, and overall, global stocks are down about $15 trillion. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, but that's half what it was just four weeks ago. Four weeks ago, global stocks had lost $30 trillion. We've retraced $15 trillion of that loss, but we still have a while to go. If you look at the breakdown by sector, again, very little in terms of surprises. Healthcare and consumer staples have been the best performing sectors. Energy and financials have been the worst performing sectors. And here I want to pay tribute to markets. I know markets get, a, get short shrift. People like to abuse markets for being inefficient and volatile. And often markets seem chaotic, especially during crises. But if you step back and look at how the market has treated different groups of stocks, there's a surprising degree of order to this crisis, right? Healthcare and consumer staples have lost the least, and that makes complete sense. And energy and financial services have lost the more than that. I'm not suggesting that every company has been correctly priced, but I'm saying overall, markets are doing a much better job than most experts are. I'll take the market's word over experts' word every single day because overall, markets are assessing damage where they should be greatest and punishing the stocks there the most. Now, if you look at the most and the least damage industries, you see the point I made about markets being sensible playing out. You look at that list of the most damaged industries, they're heavy infrastructure companies, companies that tend to borrow money. The look at the least damaged industries, you see tech, you see healthcare, you see online retail. Again, it makes sense. So again, overall, while the market seems to be chaotic, it is within sectors doing the right thing in terms of punishing and rewarding industries. Now, I did the classifications of equities. I looked at PE and momentum and price to book and dividend yield, and I won't bore you with the details. All the stories you're hearing about how this is punishment meted out for people who pushed up stocks to high PE ratios or played on momentum, none of those stories seem to hold true. The stocks that are being hurt the most in this crisis are not high PE, high momentum stocks. They're low PE, stocks that have not done very well in the years leading into this crisis, and stocks that pay a dividend. Those stocks that value investors that have said, just hold on to those stocks, they're safer. Those are exactly the stocks that are being punished the most in this crisis. The only classification where you can argue that maybe there's something you can learn about companies behaving better in the future is when you look at leverage. Companies with more net, higher net debt ratios, debt net of cash, have been damaged more than companies with lower net debt ratios. If you look across the list, you can see that leverage is the one factor that seems to be hurting companies in this market. More leverage is leading to more damage. Now let's talk about pricing. Now, when I did my value update, this was about two sessions, I'm going to argue you could value the market and you could value individual companies. I made the argument that just because there's a lot of uncertainty, you cannot just walk away from basics. You cannot say, I'm going to abandon fundamentals because I feel too uncertain. And I said, we can still value companies. And one of the pushbacks I got was, what's the point? Why would you want to value companies in the midst of all of this uncertainty? You know you're going to be wrong and horrifically wrong, so why bother? Now, I accept it. We're going to have a lot of uncertainty, but I'm not sure what these critics want to do instead. And my guess is many of them, instead of doing a full-fledged valuation, want to do pricing. What does that mean? They want to pick stocks based on PE ratios or revenue multiples on the delusion that by pricing these stocks, they don't have to make assumptions about the future. They don't have to deal with uncertainty. Now, I want to talk a little bit about pricing companies and why that is delusional to assume that you're not making assumptions about the future. If you break down the pricing process, there are basically three steps. The first is you've got to pick a multiple. When you think about picking a multiple, there's a numerator and a denominator. 
whether you're talking about price earnings ratios or enterprise value multiples, the numerator is almost always a market value. It can be the market value of just equity, market capitalization. It can be the market value of equity plus debt, that's the market value of the firm, or market value of equity plus debt minus cash, that's enterprise value. And in the denominator, you get a scaling variable because you've got to scale the market value to something that's common across companies. The scaling variable can be revenues, or if you're a pre-revenue company, it can be a driver of revenues, it can be earnings, it can be book value, or it can be a cash flow. So that's the first choice, you've got to pick a multiple. And within that choice of the scaling variable, you have to make a decision on timing. What am I talking about? If you decide to scale to earnings, you can scale to the earnings in your most recent full fiscal year. You can scale to earnings in the last 12 months, that's called trailing, you know, a trailing multiple. You can scale to earnings in the next four quarters, that's a forward multiple. Or you can scale to earnings in 2025, which is a really, really forward multiple. You're saying, why would I do that? You're going to see in a minute why crises like this will drive you to 2025. Once you've chosen the multiple, you've got to pick comparables. You can define comparables narrowly as other companies that look just like your company in terms of size and growth in the market you're in, or broadly as companies that are in the same sector globally, you don't care about size, you don't care about growth patterns. So you have to choose comparables. And if you're careful, you've got to control for differences in risk and growth and cash flows, either by telling a story or with, the st or with statistics. That's basic pricing. Let's talk about the consistency rules because when people look at pricing, they say, how do I know whether I should use PE ratios or EV to EBITDA multiples? And my response is, I don't care what you use because you're comparing across companies, at least be consistent. Consistent in what sense? If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator should be an equity value as well. If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator has to be an operating earnings or cash flow or book value. Let me explain what I mean. Let's say you use PE ratio, most widely used multiple in the world. The numerator is market cap, an equity value. Your denominator is earnings per share, an equity value. Thank God for small blessings, the most widely used multiple in the world is consistent. Or you use EV to EBITDA. Enterprise value is a rough measure of the market value of operating assets. EBITDA is a rough measure of operating cash flow. EV to EBITDA is consistent. So what wouldn't be consistent? Price to EBITDA is an abomination. Your numerator is an equity value. Your denominator is an operating cash flow. God only knows what you're going to find is cheap. Before you get too high and mighty about price to EBITDA, if you use price to sales, you're guilty of the same sin. If you're going to scale something to revenues, it's got to be enterprise value, so consistency. Second, because you're comparing this multiple across 15 or 20 companies, you've got to be consistent on timing. In other words, if you decide to use trailing earnings for one company, you've got to use trailing earnings for all 14. If you're going to use forward earnings for one company, you've got to use forward earnings for all. You're saying which one's better? There is no right multiple because what multiple you use will vary across companies and across time. And which one works is ultimately the one you're going to latch on to. So that's the definition of this. Now let's talk about whether in fact you're making assumptions when you do multiples. I'm, I'm going to cut to the chase. I do extended sessions in my valuation class where I do a little algebra. I start with a discounted cash flow model a dividend discount model for an equity multiple, a firm value model for an enterprise value multiple. And with a little algebra, I back out the variables that determine each multiple. Let me give you an example. When you look at price to book, it's driven by cost of equity, growth, your payout ratio, your return equity. Enterprise value to sales is driven by your cost of capital, your growth, your cost, your cost of capital, and your margin. With every multiple, I list out the three or four or five variables that drive it. Put differently, when you use a price earnings ratio of 50, whether you like it or not, you're assuming high growth for your company and a high return equity. You're saying, but I'm not making that assumption. No, you are. You're just not making it explicitly. When you use a price to book ratio of 10, whether you like it or not, you're assuming your company will earn a 40% return equity. Implicitly with multiples, you're making assumptions. In fact, the big difference in intrinsic valuation and pricing is an intrinsic valuation, my assumptions are explicit and open and transparent, and you can pick them apart. In pricing, my assumptions are implicit and you don't even see what they are. It's much easier to defend a pricing than an intrinsic valuation because you have no idea what I'm assuming, but it's also much more dangerous. So with that structure, let's talk about what's going to happen to multiples in a crisis. I'm going to divide a crisis into three phases. The first phase is what I call my shock and awe phase, which is the crisis hits, everybody's shocked. 
The second phase is an adjustment phase. As the crisis continues, people start to adjust. And the third phase is what's, let's call it the acceptance phase. Let's start with the shock phase. When you get a crisis and there's a shock, your first, the market reaction is market sees the shock. The prices drop almost immediately. So if you think about this crisis, February 14th, you know, it, the Italians reported that their COVID crisis in Italy, the market starts to go into a free fall. Over the next four weeks, it drops 25% in value. The market reaction is almost instantaneous. As the shock hits, the market adjusts. But if you think about the scaling variables, earnings, revenues, book value, those are all accounting numbers. First, it takes time for the shock to show up in those numbers. And second, it takes even more time for accountants to get around to reporting these numbers. So during the shock phase, here's what happens. The market price drops. Your operating numbers are still stale because they reflect pre-crisis numbers. So initially, at least in the crisis, things start to look cheaper. Why? Because the numerator is lower, the denominator hasn't changed. And you're saying, why, why can't we use forward numbers? Because in the midst of a shock, everybody pulls back. Companies refuse to give guidance, analysts don't make projections. So in other words, you're stuck with trailing numbers that are stale and everything starts to look cheap. And if you're not careful, you're going to be buying stocks that are really not cheap, but look cheap. In the second phase, the adjustment phase, a little bit into the crisis, you start to see information come out from companies. People start to emerge from the caves and start to make forecasts for the future. You start to see forward numbers. And when those forward numbers come out, people replace the stale trailing numbers with the forward numbers. And guess what happens to your multiples? They go from really low values to sky high values. Because to begin with, when you give forward numbers, big chunk of your companies are going to have negative earnings. So you're going to see people first move away from earnings to revenue multiples. Why? Desperation. You move up the income statement to get a positive number. Second, you're going to see even for companies which have earnings, the multiple goes through the roof. So you go from really low PE ratios, trailing PEs, to really high forward PE ratios. Everything looks expensive. And if you view those purely based on the number, you're never going to buy stocks in the adjustment phase because you're focused on the level of the multiples. And then comes the acceptance phase. In the acceptance phase, more information comes out. So this is two quarters, three quarters into the crisis. The operating numbers start to catch up with the shock. The trailing 12-month numbers now reflect the crisis. And guess what? They're terrible. You're going to have a lot of money losing companies. And again, you're going to see a shift to revenue multiples or to really, really forward multiples, which is people give up on revenue multiples. They say, I'm going to give you a multiple of 20, 25 earnings. Where are we in this crisis? I think we're getting towards the end of phase one. The shock is just starting to wear off, but the numbers are still being not getting updated. So here's what's happened to two multiples, and I could do this for more, but I just wanted to focus on two, P and EV to sales. These are both trailing numbers, and here's what I've done. I computed what the multiple was in January 1st, 2020, based on market cap that day, and trailing income on that day, which would have been income probably through September of 2019. Then I recomputed the number on April 1st of 2020 using the updated market cap and the updated net income. So notice what happens in every region of the world. P ratios drop. You're saying this is good. Stocks are getting cheaper. Well, stocks are getting cheaper. Earnings are just there. The same thing is true for EV to sales. You see a drop off. And this is going to happen in every crisis. It happened in 2008. It'll happen in this crisis. But this too shall pass. Right? And if you think about sectors, you see the same phenomenon. You see a drop in PE ratios, a drop in EV to sales, not because companies are getting cheaper, but because the denominator is not getting updated. So if you look at financial services now, given market cap today and net income, trailing net income, they're looking really cheap. But don't go crazy and load up on banks. You're not there yet. Now, we're just starting to see the first glimmers of information of what the crisis is doing to numbers as companies report first quarter earnings. That's going to build up over the next few weeks, the next few months. You're going to start to see the trailing numbers start to catch up uh, with the crisis. And you know what's going to happen to your trailing PE? It's going to zoom through the roof. And for many of these companies, it's going to become not meaningful. Airlines will look really cheap today using 2019 earnings. Most airlines will have not meaningful or not available for, earning, for PE ratios in about three, four, six months. So this has always been the case, and I'm not you know, using this to argue you shouldn't use pricing. I'm just saying that if by using pricing you think you're avoiding the uncertainty that I have to deal with my intrinsic valuation, that's not true. 
you're going to see yourself having to deal with the same uncertainty in different ways when you do pricing, whether you use forward numbers or 2025 earnings. And as you start to see the pricing numbers come up, remember, uncertainty is a given. You can choose to face up to it directly and make your best estimates, or you can act like it's not there. Denial is not a great strategy in investing, and uncertainty is real, it's here. And I think even if you're doing pricing, you got to start to deal with that uncertainty. So I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.